So um, why that would be duckling? Um, I gravitated towards that story of um, the ugly duckling because I think it maintains its poignance um, as it raises questions about discrimination, illustrated by the great gray ugly duckling tormented, tormented by his younger siblings. It refers to people who are different than those around you. It's about the importance of being true to yourself. It's about people, and I would argue, tough landscapes that have not yet grown into their potential talents, unique, and self awareness. Now, in the world outside that storybook, there are thousands of super fun sites and brown fields that exist that are screened with the picture. 30 years ago, I decided that I would champion these ugly records. That wish should be informed um, as it did by the past um, the bell chief families on the New Jersey Turnpike. Right? Um, I remember in the babies, uh, big team of toys belching out uh, smoke, wondering who, I began to wonder who worked there, and I wondered who lived nearby, who was downwind. Um, and um, there they were in their modest houses, and believe me, part of Jersey here, the accent is very, very strong. Um, that childhood uh, curiosity grew up when I was in first in Pittsburgh. That landscape was still steel city really sealed my obsession um, that has driven um, my life's work. Uh, in fact, my conviction sort of back a few years ago, ironically enough, to working on this very middle in Pittsburgh. There was no doubt in my mind um, that these landscapes demand landscape architects' attention which is increased, but I still think it's not substantial enough. There are not uh, enough of us yet to say that unjust ground these landscapes produce is not okay. But so this lecture, in a way, is all the grounds. Through both practice um, at Dirt Studio and teaching at UVA, that other, one, that other school, I tried to head into unknown territory. Dirt Studio was founded to do research into industrial business as usual and to champion overlooked and undervalued ugly ducklings. Teaching really actually 100%, I'd say 200% supported the development of Dirt Studio's work. Um, it was with the joy of working with students to construct a new model of knowledge and critical design choices. So here are the stories, and it's a little bit of a retrospective. I approach the deep landscapes with empathy and with awe. I continue to build upon the work of pioneers that have brought tough sites into sight and into mind. One such pioneer, Richard Person, opened minds 50 years ago to fight for the environment having rights equal to human rights. Still, as I, I still found that the regulations of, associated with these new regulations, these new laws, that the remediation approaches were um, were deeply flawed. I was pretty infuriated uh, by myopic remediation technologies that applied just an engineered uh, cover for a quick fix, a greenwash, and a fight with camouflage. And most egregious, reclamation regulations did not address the impact of communities. I wanted to find, I wanted to find alternatives to remediation, which this was this was actually a turning point for me to actually dissect these two words. And remediation, as it was commonly used, if you look up the definition, it says correcting a fault. And then I was like, no, instead I want to use regeneration, which by definition means creating new, taking what's there and creating new. Um, so after these decades of confronting these obstacles, I insist that we do the following. I think we make the transformation visible. I think we embrace the complexity. We challenge limited engineering approaches. And we give form to processes for neighbors to witness. My students were doing revolutionary things, mapping and spatializing what regulation, regulations actually look like to discern the limitations <coughs> and the injustices. They also imagine biologically based technologies to create a, a larger than life ecosystem emerging on the polluted floodplain, in this case, the Shenandoah River. 
At DIRT, we are beginning to understand that these landscapes were not just environmental disasters. They were also cultural landscapes with deep values, full of communities, uh, conflicted feelings of the worst that also died. These are the landscapes for better or for worse part of the legacy. This legacy, this troubled beauty, is what the town of Edendale, Pennsylvania, uh, has to face. Uh, this is one of the seminal projects for dirt, which goes back to 1997. Um, and so rather than see this landscape, uh, the polluted landscape as a crisis, we frame it as a possibility. Um, in this community based effort, we uh, dirt come together with a multidisciplinary team to make the transformation. The goal was um, a demonstration project that we did for the entire um, southwest, southwest Pennsylvania with the 3,400 miles of, um, of uh, waterways with the uh, Asimine Trails. So this is, gets to be the fun part, and this is when I fell in love with science. I was going to very science challenge in high school. They all the courses, I think. So I always kind of learn science as necessary, and this to me was fascinating that there was a passive treatment system that would take the, um, the acid line drainage and process it, um, and it would come, it would start out as toxic yellow or orange, and then come out as biologically rich water. So we were like, how do we actually do this, um, construct this system to be legible um, and the site, the demonstration site, is a 40-acre um, floodplain. You can see there, this is the coke ovens and the colliery, um, and you can see the amount of landscape that is completely generated. Um, the other kind of X-ray vision is when you look at, when you look at that hill, it was called hill number six, so it's, it's mine number six, and you could envision hundreds of men and boys um, in this scene, this cult scene, only four feet high, so that they have to crawl to the workplace. And your commute to be read by uh, those was could be up to 25 minutes. And in fact, this is up there is the, the, uh, the map of the mine tunnels. And you can see how it connects, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot better than the town. It's a strange kind of urbanism. And so, and we were like, mm, you know, yummy, you know. So we were looking at this and start to come up with this idea of a witness garden because as my gradient is at 8.9 pH, right back there, you know, and so that passive treatment system elevates the pH to 7.0. Um, so we, um, Bob had never drawn before. We, um, CC98 with an artistic license. We are validated it for him. So here's the we, we were talking to Bob about can we give this kind of some legible form so that everyone can really understand the progression of, um, of the um, uh, passive treatment system. So there you see that there are six bases. It also got um, according to the topography on the site. So they're all the basins. Then it goes into the emergent wetlands, which are kind of like a wash. So this is giant ecological wash you know, So there's the, the, the final rinse, and then it gets uh, um, discharged as healthy water um, into the black water. Um, this was a wonderful thing where I, uh, Stacey Levy and I were doing these extra plates, and I asked Bob uh, um, what he is, you know, can you remind me of the whole process? Because as a scientific observe, and he wrote this, and God bless him, his artistic license was still working. He started with rainfalls and ended with rainfalls. What? So beautiful, like right? explaining how the way in which we configured um, all of the spillways and everything were, were part of that uh, designing tool in that ecological washing machine. There's a um, detail, and we had a um, whole series of a planting plan. That turned out true. Chose plants that were like vivid red um, down to kind of pink green, 
things to reflect um, the process. And then there, uh, um, this is from our, um, on top of the pony pile, which is the other pile of refuse, and you know, the grading of the basins. That's a little mirror for the mirror, but that pond here on the low scale is too big. And here it is, beginning to work. And here it is, going into the surrounding landscape. There's a beautiful trail that goes by it. So it's doing its work both um, in terms of uh, um, creating the asset to drain into it, it's also doing its work in the focus story for other parts of So the next piece number two. Um, the Vidale Project challenged the linear approach of conventional remediation by accepting the cycles inherent to the process of transformation. And my hero, Robert Smithson, um, said that conflicting forces are either destructive or regenerative. The ways in the process determines the direction. That's what we do. Design is about landscape's evolution, not the solution. Designing a course of action means giving form to a site's transformation, it means changing perceptions and our methodology. In essence, we need to take the next shift, we need to build that knowledge. I sounded so smart when I shouted back off science. Um, push processes, not things, question the motives. And when all hell breaks loose, all for that. Thinking in cycles is complicated. But my students have taken it on, looking at the tempo of alternative biotechnologies for the treatment of polluted soil and water. They embrace an essential imperative take the time it takes to fully regenerate the landscape and its associated communities. At DIRT, we knew we could do a better way of, um, uh, to come up with a better way of truckloads of dirty dirt through the working neighborhood of Austin, Massachusetts. The eight comprehensible engineer soils before were, were, were a secret that we knew there was some good stuff that we could use that recipe. The client was taken back when uh, they were. Um, we showed that visualization of the hundreds and hundreds of trucks that would be rambling through the local streets and off the landfills outside the state. We proposed an alternative local dirt farm sited on a post manufacturing site. It kept all that dirt under the client's noses. Probably why we got a pat on the head and shown the door. But we had another go of it um, yeah, in, uh, the, with the Ford Motor Company. So here's an amazing um, American icon, uh, 1,200 um, acres of, of turning out to this day in Naples. But an icon, you know, uh, made notorious by artists that Henry Ford um, commissioned the Ford plant, um, namely Charles Shuler and Diego Rivera. And it was really funny that we had to remind Ford, the Ford people, that they were an icon. Like, that's very strange. But they didn't understand how their landscape was the embodiment of that, of, you know, of being that icon, the way Henry Ford understood. So here's a, um, my very first uh, scratching about an idea about creating. So this was for the y 2 k campaign. But there was an idea here about lending some transparency to the manufacturing. They had gone into hiding, they stopped all the public doors. And so when we were looking at it, there was an idea here of this way to, to frame, reframe the, um, the industry, because Bill McDonough was looking at a new way of assembling um, and how that could uh, tell a story along the road. Here you see the Blue Road is from North South and Cape, talking about a narrative there of future assembly, the present community relations. And dirt, of course, 
gravitating to the south because they're more of the annual planets. Um, we are also always, always, always in our communities. We can do, you know, material palette. Everybody does material palettes. Well, there's also the show, social palette. Um, and here is a you know, makeup of, of just, just when you went to the corn rouge on the plant, you felt it was a bit of conflict as that portion that went through. Um, my favorite image here is um, that's Bonnie, Bonnie Clyde. Um, sure. this one. Uh, here's the um, where the coke ovens look like. They're, um, they're silent now, they're abandoned. Um, coke is uh, being manufactured in China, imported. Um, and this is a super simple thing. Here, but then, you know, enter science. You're know, like, what if, well, we have two things. We have to We brought in history and we brought in science as our way of, of putting together a cultural report instead of just the um, environmental report that they were all terrified of. So, um, so the cultural report had one historian, um, he, uh, he made the argument that the book ovens should be uh, preserved. Um, they weren't the Cadillac, and I shouldn't say Cadillac, but they weren't the Cadillac of book ovens. But they made these, you know, of course, beautifully held all the history there of the whole integrated manufacturing. You know, like we were saying, if you take that away, you're taking away one of the cogs and works of understanding the, the fantastic. The other was um, to um, get hold of a, um, a scientist who, at this point, 25 years ago, the nascent science of hyperventilation was just emerging, and he was thrilled to come out of the basement with other projects to a possible field um, operation here of remediation uh, fields or remediation gardens that the folks at Port Environmental used to cringe all the time when I put these kind of cultural spins on what they were dealing with, with environmentally. They just keep saying, you know, saying this is a cultural landscape, this is a cultural landscape. It's important. So um, I would say that um, this isn't, you know, this is the, the type of design perhaps that we did the ASLA award, but the fact that we educated the work, especially the environmental uh, Ed of that um, department. Um, he actually took on this project as his own. He went to the um, conferences. I met him at a conference, a lot like that at council, and he presented this project as his own. And Clayton, uh, Dr. Wu, has gone on uh, to a lot of other <coughs> properties um, and other post manufacturing sites to keep on with this um, very uh, progressive type of communication. So three just found. If you learn about toxic soils, it's hard to it's hard to look at dirt the same way again. And when you translate the data to locate the pollution, you see exactly who's in harm's way. Poor soils, poor people. And this is unjust ground. Still, the habit of don't date, don't test, don't tell continues. Even if the soil is tested, conventional, conventional remediation usually takes in. This is this, 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 yeah. this soil. The uh, contaminated soil hopped in all the way uh, to somebody else's backyard or covered up so that we were supposed to forget. Um, so I think this is a call to do the right thing. The champion transparency, transparency to cultivate empathy to again make science a hero. <laughs> Support the drawing of a, a, a project called the Otter. The overall project is called Operation Baker um, with Mel, uh, Mel Chen. Um, and what Mel talked about with the blended soils, which are in a map right here, right? And we know who she is up there. And then the city was that Leaded soils were a disaster before disaster. So we thought, you know, how do we how do we actually take the opportunity of the regeneration of um, of um, New Orleans? Um, 
to take the opportunity to reach out. So this is um, this is a map of we took um, Dr. Albert Milky's map, which was kind of like really dorky and not spatial, and we uh, we put it on the city map so you could see exactly where the concentrations were um, per neighborhood. The other thing when you start to learn all these things that you can't be that you remember with all this research is that 400 parts per million, which you can see is, is you know, being outlined here, 400 parts per million is the EPA limit, allowable limit um, for soil. Um, and the fun fact, um, in Europe, um, the, um, the limit is 7 feet parts per million because it 100 parts per million lead is poisonous. Oops. So, like I said, it's a little bit perverse, but we were like, hey, there's a lot of the ground is, you know, is open now. What do we do to kind of rebuild? We, were, we talked about it as rebuilding and trying to really start the world and up, rather than a bunch of pink buildings like being loaded down. I don't know if people understand that reference. Um, oh, this is this funny thing about it. So, there were two parts. Operation Peter, it was completely uh, alert funded, uh, melded in this whole fundraising by having children join uh, under dollar bills in the Senate Congress. And this was our crew uh, that was difficult and dirty. He asked us if when we get this money, how do we deploy this? <laughs> so, um, so we're science, I'm learning this stuff that led never ever <coughs> leaves this. Get the sunflowers. We um, need to lock the lead. We need to make it non bioavailable so that you, you would take that you, in the lead soils we have phosphate, which could be fish meal and also, you know, biosolids, um, and it turns it into pyromorphite, which is a non bioavailable form of lead. So um, we looked also at um, locking the lead and then we were looking at a top coating for vegetation and for just an extra area. Uh, so there's an amazing amount of sediment, being sediment at the monetary uh, rate. So we were really starting to look at, okay, those, those are the ingredients. So how do we get the ingredients um, to um, everybody's backyard or to one of those sites? So you can see that lead is locked in the sediment. So this was this was the, the big idea. It was this nested kind of social infrastructure um, and remediation and regeneration infrastructure, where we are identifying all these different scale sites um, and and figuring out how they can work um, as a kind of nested system throughout the uh, throughout the city. So, for instance, a, a big extra large mud mud uh, depot. Was about you know basically gathering all those um, ingredients. Um, the, the truck or a barge, and a barge would load up the uh, depots. Um, and then the other one is a um, extra small mud square where it's at the it's at the scale of the real river. Where folks are coming uh, for testing and for real barrels full of um, ingredients. Or can traces. Site histories have remained paramount in our life and work for the dirt. We continue to work with uh, toxic landscapes, but also ones that are degraded, uh, also projects that deal with the conflicted nature of complex places. Um, site forensics became, has become paramount. This process being the primary act of design is finding. I put finding in front of design. I'd rather find, I'd rather die finding than designing. This is just so the place to end um, is where the design emerges from. So slow looking is essential. Um, process situates form as being seen more than site specific. You can, um, you can go beyond that, that it's um, site generated. So the requirements to do this is being resourceful. Have restraint, 
don't be shy, smart, common sensibility and forward for sustainability, and always let design emerge, not the same. So in this very small project, I'm going to show it's uh, um, less than an acre um, in Dallas, incredible charge of looking at this old um, pump house that was in the supply for mining. Um, and can you imagine um, being pulled by a client, getting in there and seeing this? I was kind of like, well, all I can do is mess it up. So it was just uh, um, the process of finding, the process of curating, um, really just the idea of my head drawings of, of highlighting the voids of the tanks by pulling up almost the covers of the landscapes that were around the lake um, house. And thinking of coming up, then to be planted, we have a whole bunch of concrete. Um, and you can see um, that the place, this is in the part of the most affluent um, um, uh, neighborhood in Dallas. And I, we, uh, we had I formed this path with the wonderful client. She, she was like, you guys, D, are you going to be okay with this? You're know, using busted up concrete. She goes, I want to be right on the side. <laughs> it was just great. So, also, by the way, I went right within this picture when I was taking it. I um, heard the, the um, masons, the workers, that uh, I heard them saying in Spanish something about a cartoon, and then they said, Blue Stones. Uh, so this is where Barney Rubble was born. So they loved to keep all this Barney Rubble. And we took great care in placing it. And then it was a really simple thing, this water filter. Um, we just like found the plumbing. We said, let's just turn on the water. Um, and um, on special occasions, the water flows. And then uh, it was the, the big tank. We found the plumbing again, and we just turned on the water so that the reflection of the sky, we just put two inches of water in the pages. Um, and then in the back of this tank, um, this wonderful local tree leaves and then this is the valley. Um, kind of like a scale up a lot of what I experimented with at Eternal um, Green Waterworks, <coughs> watching um, the table at um, Urban Outfitters at Philadelphia New um, York. This is what the Navy Yard looked like in its heyday, or even in, in fact the, the fleet basin up there where you see all the, um, the battleships is still passing the mission battleships. And so it's really kind of still very raw. Unfortunately, um, Robert A. Ann Stern is doing this kind of like, uh, actually, I don't care. it's a horrible mess to win. So we just want to propose an alternative um, to kind of, again, look carefully. Um, so we felt like it was a pretty great um, uh, opportunity to kind of do this nice thing with the creativity of the, um, of the um, Navy and the folks that are the designers at Free. There was just this idea that, well, how can we keep the kind of idea of a workflow flowing through this landscape? Um, it was, it's really big. You can see um, the grain of the buildings. They're only this, 300 feet long, um, most of them. Um, and another image, of course, you know, historic photos, you can just go, they're like a candy store. You know, they just want to wrap up everything you can, because they load up with x-ray vision before you go to the site, um, because you see these beautiful arabesques, right, of the rail lines that fell apart. Because this is what you, you know, um, oh, okay. Um, so those, um, those became the structure, I don't know why that did that, sorry, but I'm going to see with this, because um, this is what you found when you go to the site, right? It was two inches of asphalt. Over everything. 
And it was like, blah, you know, and but when we looked really carefully, if I could get up, I pointed to you, but there's a crack in the asphalt there, and I'm like, oh, man, there you go, rail line. So, and they didn't salvage the, um, the rail lines, which was great, so they became the kind of beautiful bones of this place. And if you look at this one, you see the swoop right there? And it's easy, right? I like looked at this and I went, design already. Don't have to do much. You just uncover it. And put some cherries on the top. It's just this idea that was just such a horror, you know, because I was like, mm -hmm. it's like three people, you know, you know how family that brand is. And I just was like, under the tree. Here is is their favorite thing now. It's cherry. I created a monster. And then what you see underneath it is Barney. This is where we stockpiled um, all of everything. I wouldn't let anything go. Uh, they are putting in, carefully putting in Barney. Girls and shoes. Well, and Barney takes on all of these different personalities at the Lady Door. Um, and if there's anything that might have been really New York and stuff. One of my favorite things, contractor so gets it, he lets the grass just die, he doesn't cut it down at all. And then this is one of my favorites, the contractor sound. And I always, I always think about Danny Barney when I look at this, because Danny Barney would show some of that that his landscape had, you know, and he'd, he'd, he'd say, I knew that would happen. I'll take credit for that. He's like, I didn't know this was going to happen, <laughs> but I'll take credit. Isn't it great? Um, and then Betty was, Betty was probably, you know, uh, she was in the fold here because of the smaller pieces of concrete of asphalt getting great. So she was a combo like that, and she went under the um, all along hedgerows that we put um, on the west side of the buildings with the big um, groups that were shaking. And this was the calculation we were doing. Um, to, um, and it turns out that we we got to, I think, 85 to 90 percent of material use. Um, we never showed this image to the founder of Urban. When he once, I once started to kind of go there and he called me, he goes, who do you think you are, Al Gore? <laughs> so I never any of that up. I just like bowing around the back door. I was like, isn't it beautiful? Yeah. <laughs> um, there, there's Betty underneath the head. Those guys were up. And this is a little bit of a quiz. Another example of the um, quiz company we came in and gave when we had a lot of work. And who is that? Oh, oh. redhead, Noma. I wish I brought this. I, I wish I brought this image of the, the main dude, you know, number one, but that urban uh, um, is in the construction control. They had Barney, Betty, Wilma, Bam Bam, and they all had what it was. And that's and it was so funny to hear. What Hey, Julie, you got Barney or Betty? <laughs> More obsession with rails. This is our uh, second phase, or third phase. I work on four phases there. Uh, but it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And what we did is just, you know, basically telegraph, right? Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. It's, uh, this is we sort of the cleaves. All of the, all of these having to do you guys with some level of intimacy within this immense industrial landscape, right? So we always we always try to play between those two things. When they were they came they were they were in. And you know, when it came to uh, 
but I got one, I um, I really advocated, and I find that you know we often do this. We have to advocate for the public realm within a private enterprise. So a lot of so when we were assigning the landscape around um, the dry dock, I had to kind of really steer them over and over towards not having it feel so privatized. You know that the whole of the Navy Yard and people coming from Philadelphia um, would feel welcome there. I love these immense sprouted mm -hmm. images, but this is actually one of my favorites. I love the sweet spot. Last piece, five. How long matters. Um, when I started spending uh, more time in cities like Detroit, working on standalone industrial sites, expanding into thinking about the fallow land surrounding them. These open, some people think it. I know. They're open, spacious. They're exempt from lateral damage of lost industries and lost jobs. I would argue that this land is not vacant, not inert. This element, this land is valid by definition, intentionally laying idle until its next evolution. But in many cities, this land is vulnerable, subject to carpet backer developers buying it up as cheap. Profit. profit that does not necessarily benefit um, residents who have been made. This is a collaboration with Steve and Warren in San Antonio, Texas, where the Falco land there was posted as a landscape. We can, um, with this Falco land, we can strive to trigger new growth that is authentic and equitable. With Falco land that is new growth, neighbors can How might these landscape of urban wilds and tough parks serve their place in the neighborhoods where they can be valued as novel ecosystems and cultural touchstones? Note the restraint. A few things in this wilderness that respects the environment. So, what is the mission? I'd say it's seeing optimism, seeing fullness in the fallow that wilds keep us civilized. My students take on, took on this issue in Detroit's abandoned land where they reconsider um, its urban dormancy. And I love this, uh, this woman's work um, where what she's doing here is um, putting a figure. Um, she basically is saying the open land can become basically. This new blue, this I mean, we bring it into one of our parks, but we point at parkland as this. The distinction is difficult, but I think it's something we can make. Um, for a lot of these uh, student, uh, students that have so much land, how do we actually bring it into the fold in a pretty cheap and cheerful way? So we, in this case, in Poor City um, neighborhood in Detroit, it's north of downtown. Um, and in this illustration, what you're seeing in the, the, the land that has the tunnel, that is all land that has mm -hmm. um, been um, uh, it's depopulated. It's been abandoned. Um, six, six, uh, six remaining families of the And I've been working with a really um, incredible developer and, uh, because he's amazing, he is like says the landscape is first. You know, the local landscape first, and then you can go down. Like, Hello, who are you? So, so this is one very small um, uh, project. You can see it's in amongst one and two story um, industrial buildings, which is the more, I mean, thousands of these are in Detroit and other manufacturing cities. So I got away from the big behemoth, I call the mega farmer, you know, to be interested in these that are happy to be in the So, so there it is. This this shot to me always reminds me of the moment I uh, arrived and I'm standing next to fill up the door. And he said, Julie, what would you, what, what would you do? And I'm like, ooh, you know. 
And I knew that, if you look at the lower left image there, I knew that there was an image across there. Um, and, and I said, when was it raised? And they said the 70s. And I went, mm, right at the time that we usually bulldoze it into uh, the basements. So I blurred it. <laughs> and literally the next day, he goes, oh, you're hired. And it's okay. And so, so we basically had literally this the design of the, um, the design of this park emerge. And Lori B, the most amazing moment on site was when they brought out a huge piece of the wrist on our sea stone and it was the cornerstone. The I was like, that kind of went. It's like all of shit. And you know, in my mind it's like the, the, the park just being like hundred years you know, the age. It's just oh and you can make it Philip is always so proud that you know that I when everybody was saying, Oh, put it up in a pedestal, put it up, I went, like, no, put it down there. Put it in the ground. And all the we took this one the other Bits in the little terraces. Um, this is the overhead we had. Um, we did um, the urban canopy. So everything came up from the ground. This is how to do the wash out. I'm sorry. Um, this is Bay Bay. Um, we took the pump where there was concrete, you know, at that down the end of, you know, the bucket and you know the um, and he just slammed to make it create a um, a tree pit. <laughs> and it's a pretty happy thing. The neighbors, you know, the neighbors love it. It's, yeah, it's 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 kind of a gift. So I looking at the underbelly, looking at the underbelly of landscapes and advocating for them and their surrounding communities may involve becoming an advocate. Uh, in my experience, it's not about turning yourself or the site into a swamp. It's just a matter of being able to see the swamp. Thanks.